We're going to talk about a great untapped market. And how untapped it is, is the result of several different things. First of all, there's an unpublished set of statistics about the business produced by top of the table members of the Million Dollar Roundtable. And when I give you these three pieces of information, you'll understand perhaps why some of the folks who pay for lots of ads in Round the Table magazine and other publications wouldn't really like to see this published. And then you'll understand. But it's true. Over 60% of the premium dollars turned in by top of the table members comes on corporate checks. Now, very few annuities are paid for with corporate checks. They're personal person, uh, purchases. So this is not coming from individual money. It's coming from business money. Now, of course, there are some annuities that are purchased by corporations, but not very many. And we all know the reasons for that. The government didn't like it. The second th thing that's very important is that most of the top of the table people. If you ask them for their business card, they will hand you one that says John X, X Financial Services. It does not say ABC Life Insurance Company. Now, if he goes to a company convention and they ask for his, someone in the home office asks for his card, he pulls out a different business card. But they're doing business under a corporate entity because they're selling multiple products to, for, to fulfill multiple needs. And the, the third item that I think is important is that the million dollar, the top producing individuals who are doing business like this are almost without exception charging fees. Now, some are charging large fees and some are charging smaller fees, but a growing percentage of those people are having clients pay them a retainer fee. They're billing it sometimes monthly, sometimes quarterly, sometimes annual. And this is especially true of corporations who are their clients. I know one million dollar roundtable member whose name would be familiar to any of you who are members of the roundtable. As a matter of fact, some members of his family would also be familiar to you. He tells me that he, at the start of the year, he knows he can book $20 million worth of business just on upgrades to existing company plans for buy, sell, stock redemption, et cetera. That's new, brand new business. That's not like, you know, renewal income and at low commissions. This is at high commission business. So this is where there's a big untapped market. Now, one of the reasons is the life insurance companies aren't training people how to sell life insurance anymore. Many, many years ago, the Life Underwriter Training Council, which was an independent organization formed by NAFA, trained people how to approach small and gradually larger businesses. And that organization is really out of business. It, it, it fell on, into uh, financial disarray. It was then transferred to the American College. And it's no longer a training program. It's an educational program. And the American College, as most of you know, does a very good job of education, but it doesn't do training. It doesn't have people go through exercises to do something better. So we're not training, and we haven't been training people to come into the business market for about 30 years. And it's having a tremendous impact. It's an untapped market. So what I want to encourage you to do is to go where the money is. Go after the corporate dollar. And I'm not suggesting that what I'm going to talk about with you this morning is something that you should stop doing what you're already doing. I'm going to just simply point out that you can do more business in this market and add recurrent revenue, not recurrent old money revenue, recurrent brand new money at new commission structure just by keeping the plans up to date. Let's take a look at some historical perspective. This is an underserved market. People aren't calling on companies. Now, I know that we're in a recession, and you know it very well. And that means some of the businesses you would call on are also in a recession. But some of them are not. Some of them are doing really well. And they're building bigger and bigger problems. We're going to talk about what some of those problems are. But the point is, there are prospects galore. Now, in the upper left corner of this slide, you see the pictures of the people that are obviously in some form of medical profession, or perhaps they're scientists. A lot of these people are not working for hospitals. They're working for a corporation that is offering its services 
uh, to hospitals and to medical facilities. They're privately owned businesses, even though they may go to work in a nonprofit organization. Now, when we talk about businesses, we're talking about certain types of businesses that you can call on very easily, that are in your neck of the woods, that are easy to approach because they haven't been approached for years by anyone who's competent, well-trained, and handles themselves effectively. And this excludes certain types of businesses. Yes, you may have a GE plant in your town, but the chances that you're going to sell GE by calling on the local uh, uh, factory that's manufacturing jet engines or something is none, because they don't make those decisions there. So there's a lot of, of businesses that are doing well that are not owned in your area, and the chances are almost nothing that you can go up through those ranks and get to the decision makers. So you don't market to them. You can't market to nonprofit organizations. They don't, they're not a business. You have individuals who work for government agencies and, and military organizations. You can't market business planning services to those people because they're not a corporation. Most franchises are not prospects for you. You go to the local Wendy's or McDonald's, it's owned by somebody out of town, or it's a company store. They're not a prospect for you either way. So one of the things that you would do to tap this market is use some people who have demographic skills. And that's RME, and probably the only other organization that has data that has really in-depth information on businesses is Hoover's, which is a division of Dun & Bradstreet. And they're very effective. But they don't send out the mail. They just can sell you the lists with a lot of backup information. You still need to go out and reach those individuals. So what we have here is a vacuum. We have a perfect storm that's creating a tremendous market. And if you don't go after that market, somebody else will. And if you don't take those premium dollars, somebody else will. And we'll talk about some cases. Why should you charge a fee? Do you think that a business person would respond to an attorney who says, why don't you hire me to be your corporate counsel, and I'll work and work and work and work, and if you like me, well, you can do some legal work with me after I do all of the analysis to find out what your problems are. They wouldn't hire anybody like that. They'd expect to pay that attorney a fee. They would expect to pay their accountant a fee. If they hire an architect to redesign their building or to build a brand new facility, they're going to expect to pay the architect a fee to design the building, and they're going to pay another fee to have him supervise the construction. They're going to pay you a fee as a, if you deliver financial advice to their company, and they expect to pay you a fee, and if you don't charge a fee, you have just lost credibility. You've got to have the facility to charge a fee. And that is a fee for the advice. It is not a fee for the product. You do not change the compensation on the products. And if the members of the top of the table can charge fees without any question, you can do it. Now, I've had a lot of people say, but Ed, you don't understand. We can't charge fees in whatever it is our town. And that's not true. I started charging fees in 1968 in a town with 45,000 people in southwestern Ohio. Now, if you can collect fees in that sort of a community, you can do it in a lot of more affluent communities where most of you live. Fees can be charged. You've just got to have a procedure and a process for it. You can't tell someone directly, I'm going to give you good service. I'm going to guarantee my work. I am going to have a high ethical standard. I'm not going to give your private information to anyone else. But you can do all of that. And I'll show you some techniques on how to do it. Business owners have important issues. And these issues call for financial products and additional services. Now, some of those additional services are analysis that you perform, and some are legal services or accounting services that are performed by the accountants and attorneys who are on retainer and who are being paid additional money to do that analysis. We're talking about non-cancellation of business loans. Do you think there are very many corporations in America today that are growing, 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 and don't have any bank debt? There are a few, but not very many. What are they doing? They're using the basic principles of OPM, other people's money. Go and borrow the money from the bank. Now, if their spouse had several million dollars, would they go to the bank and borrow it? No. 
If they had several million dollars in the bank in cash, would they borrow it from the bank and pay 8, 10% or whatever the interest rate is when they are, their money sitting in the bank is earning zero or to 1%? No, I don't think so. So when people borrow money, it means they don't have the cash. Now when you look at the loan agreement that they signed with the bank, you find something called default provisions. And the default provisions, number one, the most important one is, if the individual who has guaranteed that loan, and that also often includes the spouse, if they die, guess what? The loan has to be paid now and in cash. If they had the cash, they wouldn't have borrowed it, so they don't have the cash. Are those loans insured? Well, nowadays, most of the new loans being made through Small Business Administration assistance, they're insured with decreasing term insurance. Well, what, what are people doing? They're borrowing money, they're paying it down, and then they're expanding their business and they're borrowing more money, and they're paying it down, and pretty soon they're not insurable. But this need for money keeps increasing. This means automatically selling more and more. The insurance agent who proposes and fulfills a need for permanent life insurance to cover a loan should add another 50% of term just to take care of the next purchase. They have succession plans. Now some succession plans cause, almost all succession plans cause a need for more life insurance, either within the company or to balance the estate. And estate Balancing is a very, very critical issue because people have children who are going to be in the business and they want them to have the business, but they're going to have other children that are not in the business and they want to provide an equal share of the estate to them, but they don't want them running their brother's business. And so this means insurance for estate equalization. They need disability and critical illness insurance. You can now buy, on a corporate basis, almost an unlimited amount of long-term disability insurance. You can buy critical illness insurance, several up to four to five million dollars in the event of a critical event should take place. Planned giving gives tremendous opportunities. There are a lot of business people who want to do more for some organization, a college, a university, a church, an organization that has certain beliefs that they want to support. They want to do something for them, but they also want to have succession planning in their business and they want to have a state equalization for, among their heirs. And the charitable giving opportunity gives them ability to use the charitable wrapper inside the deal. And I will tell you, you will never have an accountant suggest that. But they will all say, when asked, can we do this? Yes, you can do that. Is that a good idea? Well, yes, if that's what you want to accomplish. You'll get tremendous support from these other professionals. Why? Because when you put those plans in place, they're going to need to have some more accounting and some more legal work. And they like that idea. But they also intellectually know that you've developed a creative idea and solution for something that they hadn't offered. So they're going to jump on the bandwagon real quickly and saying, oh yes, I can help with that. Loan defaults are a major, major problem for banks. They don't like losing loans because somebody has died unexpectedly. And this is a tremendous opportunity. I know a financial advisor who put together, at my suggestion, a relatively small loan insurance coverage. It was about $800,000, not a big loan, okay? $800,000, he sold an $800,000 whole life policy. He assigned the policy and the collateral in the policy to the bank, and the bank said, this is wonderful, this is great. A couple of weeks later, the banker called him and he says, you know, I've been thinking about something. I have a portfolio of loans that I manage here at the bank. And I've gone through, and we have 22 loans, corporate loans, that are not insured. And I really like your approach. He says, can you work with me and insure those loans? Now, some are going to be smaller than 800,000, but a lot of them are going to be a lot, a lot bigger. And what company wouldn't be responsive to someone who says, if I can show you how to cover your six million dollar loan without any increase in cash flow, wouldn't you want to do it? Now they have to say yes to that. And the moment they say yes to that, you just made a sale. Because it is easy to cover that cash flow. If we have a chance, we'll talk about that. You have to have a funded succession plan. 
And people who put together these succession plans and don't have funding and haven't gotten the buy-in from their key employees, they've got a problem waiting to happen because nobody knows who's going to be running the company. Do they have up-to-date trust agreements? Do they have a trust protector? How many of you have a trust protector named in your own trust? One, two, three, four. You have trusts without a trust protector. What are you going to do when the trustee doesn't perform? And that could just as easily be an individual trustee as it could be a corporate trustee. A lot of corporate trustees, primarily bank-owned trust, com trust companies, do a terrible job of administration of the trust. But how do you fire them if you don't have a provision in the trust to do it? And in order to have a provision, you've got to have somebody who has the authority to do it, and that's a trust protector. The trust protector is named in the trust instrument. Now, corporations that have a buy-sell agreement, ask them, do they have a trust agreement to hold the shares and the insurance? Well, why would I do that? Because the person who gets the cash may not follow through with the agreement. And there was a very large newspaper in Louisville, Kentucky, that had exactly that situation. They collected lots of life insurance, and when the death occurred, the, the guy that got the insurance who was supposed to buy the shares from his family members said, I'm not going to do it. The stock's gone down in value. I'm not going to pay that. That was the agreement. That's what he was supposed to do. He said, I'm not going to do it. Hundreds of millions of dollars in legal fees between uh, as long as it was fighting and the value of that paper has gone down and down and down, and they've had to sell off a lot of ancillary uh, investments. Now, what is it that the trust protector does besides the ability to, to fire the trustee? The trustee continues the appointment of somebody known as the trust financial advisor. Many trust agreements do not have a trust financial advisor named in the instrument. If you put the plan together, you should be the trust financial advisor, which means that that money and all of the purchases later and later and later are going to come through you. But you can't name a trust, advise, trust financial advisor if you don't have a trust protector so you can see how this is really important. And it has a critical impact on business owners because the amounts of money are so large that they can be with market fluctuations subject to disintermediation. Corporate philanthropy. You go to the opera, you go to the symphony, you go to these organizations and you look and see who are the donors. And it's usually corporate money. And if anybody can afford, afford to give 25 to $50,000 for a symphony or an opera company, they, can, they have needs that you can fill. They have unfulfilled circumstances. They're great opportunities. Employee retention. Almost every company has someone that's really critical, that's not a CEO, that's not a shareholder, but they're critical. It might be their designer. It might be someone who writes their copy, and they have a tremendous advertising program, and that's the secret to their success. Do they have any special plan to keep those folks in, in business? One of our RFC members uh, had an opportunity to see an old, old, old client of his. Now, when I say an old client, this is a client he made his first sale to 45 years ago. And so this chap said to him, he says, you know, he said, uh, I bought life insurance from you a long time ago, uh, and as a matter of fact, I still have that policy. And he looked down and he saw his gold RFC pen on his jacket, and he says, what's that? And he says, well, I'm a registered financial consultant. Now, he had thought of him as a life insurance agent. He says, oh, financial consultant. He says, oh, you know, I have a, a financial problem. I wonder if you can help me. He said, well, sure, what, what could I help you with? He says, well, he says, I took over the management of this company. I'm on a seven-year contract, and my job is to triple the value of the stock in seven years. And if I do, they're going to pay me an obscene amount of money. And if I don't, they're going to fire me. And he says, I've got a great management team of 13 individuals, and I want to keep all of those people for seven years. Don't care what happens to them after seven years. I want to keep them absolutely for seven years. Could you help me with something like that? He said, well, sure we could. He says, send me a fax with the names, the birth dates, the titles, and the current salary of each one of those individuals. He had it in three hours. He put together a plan. He had critical illness insurance, he had disability provisions, and he had the bulk of the funding done with permanent cash value life insurance. Plain vanilla insurance from a very substantial company. And he says, now the way this works is very simple. We're going to have 
one unit for each one of your key people. And he says, so that's 15 units. And we're going to put $300,000 into the account every year for the next seven years. And we're going to have death benefits, we're going to have disability benefits, we're going to have retirement benefits. And the guy says, how does this work? And he showed him the numbers. And he says, that's fantastic. But he said, you mentioned 15. He says, we only have 13 executives. He says, well, that each of them gets one share and you get two. Now, you can do the math, okay? 15 shares at $300,000 a piece, annual premium insurance. He didn't do too bad. Corporate sale made, to some extent, you might say it was made because he made a good sale 40 years ago. But he still made a pretty good sale. This is employee retention. There are people that need disability coverage. Critical illness is an in increasingly going to get more and more attention. It's the fastest growing product in the financial services industry by percentage, not by, by dollars. But the commissions can be very substantial. We also know that business owners are very, very well connected. They're members of clubs and organizations, and they know lots of people, and they like referrals for their business. And therefore, because they know the value of referrals to their business, they know the value of referrals to your profession, and they will give you referrals. And they would like to know if you called on them. They don't expect you to tell them the details of anything, but they really want to know that you called on them. And this was something that Norm mentioned earlier. Well, how do you reach these people? Well, you put together seminars. You can do seminars for business owners, and they don't need to be large seminars. It'd be great if you had a large seminar, but it doesn't need to be large. If you don't, because the, the payoff per client is the same. Now, what we think is you really need some people helping you do this. Your role is critical in this because you're the person that's going to be up front with those clients. You're going to be the person orchestrating the intellectual uh, recommendations and who's going to be making the sale. RME is going to help you gain the prospects. They're going to put the prospects in front of you. Regardless of which one of the various services RME has, they're going to be able to help you acquire more clients. And the RFC can help you because we have a course in business financial planning. It's a one day or two day, depending upon the circumstances, workshop. Unlike a lot of, of workshops, you and I have gone to lots and lots of association meetings. And an awful lot of those meetings, you walk away and you say, well, that speaker's making really a lot of money, or they're very talented, or they're very gracious on the stand. But what is it they really do to make that money? And the truth is they never told you, and they never will. Because they think this is very proprietary information. If they can keep it a secret, it's going to be more valuable. It's not. It'd be more valuable if they let it out. But they don't necessarily know that. But I've gone to hundreds of meetings where people tell me how successful they are, but they don't tell me anything about how to do it. So I said, you know, I'm going to never do that. So when people come to a workshop on business planning, they get a 200-page manual. All reproduced are the, the presentations for the workshop, so they don't have to write the notes down. They can just scribble, scribble uh, in the margins the impact of, the, of that information. That also includes documents checklists, and so on. So when you want to enter the business market, you need to employ a marketing system. And that's getting people in front of you. That's demographics for selection. Who are the right people to invite to a seminar for business owners? Totally different group than the individuals you would want to sell uh, fixed annuities to for retirement or pre-retirement. You have to have follow-up correspondence. Now, that's really important. We've heard the phrase used by a number of the speakers, drip marketing. You need to be doing some drip marketing. Well, drip marketing really consists of three things. It consists of a letter of some sort that describes something that is of value to the individual getting it. There is the item of value, which could be a booklet, but could just as well be a five, six, seven, eight, nine page article. And it could have the date that it was printed and could have the recipient's name on the top, which makes it very personalized. Now, if you read a nine-page article prepared on a word processor and it has your name on the top of that, sooner or later in those nine pages, you're going to notice your name is on there and it was printed the day it was mailed. And it's the same day as on the, as on the stationery. 
And then you have to have a system that says we're going to send these out on an automatic basis. So once you put somebody into the marketing sequence for drip marketing, then they're going to get those letters until you say stop. Now, how many letters does it take before you're going to get through to those people on the telephone and make the appointment? Less than 12, but somewhere in that number. And what's going to happen is you're going to call, and if you're, we're dealing with business owners, it's not bad to have a staff person call, but it really needs to be you because they want to identify with you. So when you call and you get their answering machine, because that's what they put on their card, because they're trying to, to keep you know, people away from taking their valuable time. You see an awful lot of this. So do you give them a message? Do you, do you say, call me back, give me, here's my number? They're not going to call you back based on that. You just simply say, hi, this is Ed Morrow. I had been sending you the information that you requested as a result of attending our workshop on solving financial problems for business owners. I'm really sorry I missed you. Hope I'll catch you next time. Click. What is this saying? It's sending the message that you are going to continue to, to, to uh, contact them, but it's also saying that you don't expect them to write down that number, which you would probably read too fast anyway. And then they'd have to play it back again, and then they gradually a sense of irritation is building, connected with your name or your company, because you're expecting them to write down a number and call you back. It's a waste of time, because they won't do it. Now, when there's something that comes in the mail that they want more information on, then they will call and they get your answering machine, <laughs> if necessary, depending upon the time of day. And they get your answering machine and they say, hi, this is so-and-so, you've been sending information to me. Now, of course, they're in your computer for your drip marketing, so you know how to find them. They say, I really was interested in that last article you sent me. How could we do something about it? You have to present a business image. And that means that from the moment they walk into your office, nothing says products to them. If you've got some great certificates that imply that you've sold millions or billions of dollars worth of products, get rid of them. Don't let them be anywhere people can see. Look at any magazines, anything that they can see, and it should not say products. Yes, you sell products, but you sell products to solve problems. They're interested in the solution to the problem, not in whether or not you sell X amount of insurance with ABC company. It's very important to create that right image. You want to deliver excellent plans. Now, I know some of you will say, but I've done some really great plans, hand them to the clients, and the clients look at them, don't read them. You can tell that they spend 30 seconds glancing at the plan. In 30 seconds, they can know whether you've really done the job or not. They don't have to know all the details. If they like you and they trust you and they believe you're competent, they're going to do business with you, but they do want to see a nice, polished plan because that's their defense mechanism if their accountant says, why in that devil are you doing this? You know? So the plans are important, but not because they're going to read all of it. It's because it proves you've done the work they paid for. RME is going to deliver the market to you. They have the ability to screen out qualified business owners. They can send professional invitations in a variety of mechanisms. I'm not talking just the mailers. They can arrange seminars or appointments. And they can provide confirmations of the dates of the meetings. And they will tell you that when you get names of people who've expressed interest and they don't come to your seminar, they're just as good a prospect as the people who came. The same percentages would apply if you have a system to drip market to them. And you should have that because you've spent the money to contact them. You might as well follow up with the other one third of the people or a quarter of the people who didn't show. You need to have PowerPoint presentations. Business people today are are accustomed to persons who are selling them large systems and large pieces of equipment or trying to get them to put in an advertising or promotional program or buy a territory for them, they're, coming, they're going to give them a PowerPoint presentation. They respect it if you give them a good PowerPoint presentation. But the PowerPoint presentation should not have the name of a broker dealer or an insurance company on it. It should have, in a very discreet fashion, your company's name or your personal name, and that's it. It's not a product sale. They expect you to have this. It lets them know you're professional and you're prepared. Are they going to memorize the presentation? Of course not. 
But sometimes they'll say, could I have a copy of that? And you should be very, very delighted if they ask for that because it means they're serious. You have to use consulting procedures. If you're going to act as a consultant, you have to act consistently as a consultant. You can't be nine-tenths consultant and one-tenth salesperson because they will, they will identify the salesperson. People don't want to do business with salespeople. They want to do business with financial advisors, consultants, and professional individuals. And we have to remember that that distinction is important. They expect you to do calculations. You've got to calculate the value of the business. How important could valuing the, the, a business? There's a lady who attended our workshop in the Philippines. And she took very good notes. She came back a month later when I did the course again, took notes again. And finally, she said to me, I understand it. I'm going to call on some boys I went to school with who've done pretty well in business. And I've never had the courage to call them because I didn't think I had anything to sell them because they're already making a lot of money. So she called on these people. They had a chain of restaurants. And if you've ever been to the Philippines, you've driven past Jollibee's restaurants. That's the McDonald's of the Philippines. She called on them. And she said to them, she says, you know, I'm a financial consultant. And they said, well, I thought you were an insurance agent. She says, no, I'm a financial consultant. I've gone through financial consulting training, and I want to talk to you about a problem I think you guys have. But I think you need to hire me to do this analysis. And they said, what do you mean? Now, remember, she had the image from way back of being an insurance agent. She was a successful insurance agent, but nothing astronomical, OK? She said, well, she says, I do a financial process analysis. And I will tell you whether I think you have a major problem that I suspect is the case. And I will show you the size of that problem. And I will also offer you the solution. And what I do is I charge you a fee. And she quoted him a fee of $5,000 US. Now, in the Philippines, that is a lot more money than $5,000 is in the, in, in the United States. Okay? She quoted it to them in US dollars because that had a cachet of greater value than if she quoted the same amount in pesos, which is about 40 to 1 at this point in time. So she made the, her, the presentation. She came back. She said, here's the problem. You, you, you want to have a succession arrangement, but you don't have one in writing. And we need to do this. She says, now, each of you have told me you don't want to do business with your partner's family members, their sons, daughters, grandsons, whatever. You want to, if you're the surviving partner, you want the business. And they said, yes, that's right. And she says, now, how much do you think your business is worth, each of your share? And they said, $14 million. She says, no. She says, I've done the valuation analysis. She showed them a two-page valuation analysis produced on an Excel spreadsheet. Didn't say Excel on it, but it was a simple Excel spreadsheet. It calculated the value of the business. It used generally accepted principles of valuation that any accounting firm would say, yeah, they're all realistic. It gave them four methods of valuing the business, averaged them out, and she says $24 million. She says, so it's very simple. You have an agreement. You sign the agreement, and you agree that if in the event something happens to your partner, you're going to pay his family $24 million, and you own the company. And she says, and you, you do have $24 million in cash, each of you, right? Well, of course, she knew they didn't. She knew how much the, the corporation had, which was great cash flow, making profits, opening new stores every month. But they didn't have $24 million in US currency in value. She says, well, I could provide the $24 million if you'd like. And they said, how would that work? She says, well, it's very simple. You just put 3% of $24 million into an account, and I'll come in. Something happens to either one of you. I come in with $24 million. Now, this is not a new approach. You understand that. You've all heard this. OK. Ben Feldman said, I sell dollars for three cents on the dollar. All right. But she used that as her close. And she says, you want to do this or not? They said, well, of course we want to do it. They didn't ask her what the insurance company was. Now, she happened to represent a company called Insular Life, which is a Philippine-only company. Now, you know they can't keep $24 million of risk on one person. There's, there's no, almost no insurance company in the world that will take $24 million at the outset on one risk. But at any rate, she went into the home office, 
And she said, to, walked into the office of the chairman of the board of the company. Now bear in mind, she's an agent, successful, but nothing, not the company leader or anything like that. She goes into the office of the chairman and she says, sir, would you mind as a favor to me to be the endorsing officer on this application form? Now in the Philippines and in most countries, including most states in the United States, a corporate officer has to sign that they receive the application paper. And so he says, well, I've never done that. And she says, well, right here is the line for officer signature, and you just sign this. And she says, I, it would be a real favor to me if you would do it. And so he signs his name, and then he looks up at the top of the paper, and he says, my goodness, you've written a 24 million peso policy. We've never, writ we've never underwritten a policy of that size. That's fantastic. And she says, would you sign the other one too? And he realizes there's two applications. And he says, that's 48 million pesos. She says, sir, that's dollars. By far the largest insurance policy ever sold in the Philippines. And not bad for a lot of other countries as well. Now, what's gonna happen to the value of that restaurant chain? It's going to keep growing, okay? She still hasn't touched on their bank borrowings. She still hasn't talked on incentive plans to keep their store managers. Every one of their store managers needs an incentive plan because they don't want them to leave Jollibee's and go to work for McDonald's and take all of the knowledge and skills they have because they make what the Filipinos will tell you is a better hamburger. Now, I'm not sure, but it certainly fits their taste. The point that I make is that she now is, has just a steady flow of, of business that they're going to do. You realize that if she needs referrals, all she has to say is who are you buying buns from, who are you buying the meat from, who are you buying the cups and saucers and everything else. All of the people that are their vendors who vend to them, if she uses their name as a referral to the head of that company and they're their largest customer, she has an appointment. She's got 60, 80% chance of a sale. She'll never lack for work. Fortunately, she doesn't want to quit. <laughs> the company's uh, trying to figure out how to provide an incentive plan for her. She says it should have four wheels and a symbol on the front that looks like a three-piece piece of pie. They're trying to figure out how to, how to do that. The point that I make is, though, that you have to have systems. And those systems have to be consistent. You have to have a process track. So many of the speakers have talked about financial planning and their services being a process. You have to have a process. And the process for business planning is just as complicated as it would be for other types of planning. But you have to have it. And you have to be able to show it to someone. Now, when you do that, You have it in print. And you can put their name on the PowerPoint page, and you can present this chart. And you can say this is a seven-step financial planning process for business owners, and there's 37 sub-steps. And this is the process I'm going to do if I'm going to do a financial plan for you and for your business. Now, my client has this process chart. Does he understand the chart? No. He isn't, doesn't need to understand the chart. He needs to understand that I understand the chart, that I have a process, and that process calls for the payment of a fee, and the payment of the fee establishes credibility. Now, before I had that meeting, what did I need to do? I needed to send a letter to the individual and an agenda. Norm talked about the value of agendas every Corporation that has, a, buy, has a, a board meeting has an agenda. Everybody that runs a conference or an educational event like this one has an agenda. And he who plans the agenda controls the meeting. I can assure you the chairman of the board of every public company determines what goes on the corporate agenda for the annual meeting. Because that's how he's going to control dissident members from giving him a hard time. If you're going to put together a plan using a 37-step process, you need to have the detail 
of those processes. And you'd be able to go down and check it off. You could even say to your client, I use a master planning checklist to produce your plan. And I'm going to go through every one of these items and check off the ones that need to be addressed versus the ones that have already been addressed or that don't apply to your particular business. This is letting them know that you are credible. These are credibility tools. In the process of this, you're going to need to have an engagement agreement. Now, an engagement agreement should be on one page of paper, one page only. Lawyers don't like one-page agreements, you know that, but nevertheless, it can be done because of the way in which you do this. What is the thing that's in the back of the mind of whether this is an individual or a company when they're going to pay a fee for a financial plan? Am I going to get my money's worth? That's what's in their mind. When you and I buy upscale goods and services from a, a, a business enterprise, whether this is an automobile or a watch or a, a superior piece of, of clothing, whatever it is, you expect a guarantee, don't you? I bought a watch in 1974, and they said I had a lifetime guarantee with the watch. I didn't think that it really was going to work, but it was a nice watch, and I was in a position to buy it at the time, so I bought the watch in 1974. Last year, the little uh, item on the edge of the watch, the stem, fell off. Now, this was gold, and it had a little opal inside of it, very tasteful, small, but you, you couldn't get this anywhere else but the manufacturer. So I sent it back to the manufacturer through their office in New York, and they sent it to Switzerland. The people in Switzerland fixed it, sent it back to the people in New York, and they called me and says, okay, we're, we've got your watch, we're gonna charge your credit card for it. And I'm thinking, what is this gonna cost? You know, it goes back to Switzerland and everything else. I said, well, okay, how much is it? And she says, well, it'll be $24.60. Now, this is solid gold. It can't possibly be $24, right? We know that, and plus the labor and everything. She says, that's the postage, sir. She says, remember when you bought the watch? Lifetime guarantee. Now that's a company with credibility. Next time you go shopping for a watch, plan to live a long time and buy a Chopard, okay? The point that I make is that you can give a guarantee to your financial services, and it's called a assurance certificate. And it says if you're not 100% satisfied with the plan that I deliver to you for whatever X dollars that you've agreed to, to pay, you're going to get your money back. Now, I've been issuing plan satisfaction certificates since 1968. Now, this one is a little more fancy. It has a nice border. It's in color. And you notice I've dressed up these items by putting a border around them makes them more important. When you deliver something of this kind, you sign it in front of the individual. You do not sign it in advance. You sign it in front of them, and you make a ceremony of handing that to the client. And you do that like the Asians deliver business cards. This make, the, the border makes it important. We want people to believe that we have ethical standards. We sign a code of ethics, and we hand it to them. Now, does a code of ethics make you ethical? No. You know that. It's a piece of paper. But it means you're thinking about it, and they like it because it's professional. So you can sign that. You have a non-disclosure commitment because they're concerned about their information. All of this is the process that works. You have various different steps. You have to introduce and motivate the clients, you have to gather all the information. Now this is about the same as for individuals, we just used a little bit different phrases. You prepare the analysis, you deliver the plan, you fund their goals, and you monitor the success. That's the financial planning process for businesses. You have to make simple decisions. You want to do something about this now, later, or never. That's up to you. You know what RME will do? They'll help you gather the prospects. RFC, our association can do, is deliver the process. All of the PowerPoints, documents, everything I've talked about is included in our workshops. We give away the store for a very small fee, but we're a nonprofit professional association. That's our job, to help people do a better job of serving their customers. And so basically, 
you know, what you have to decide. Do you want to work in this market? Do you want these tools? Do you want to maybe delegate this to a partner or a business associate or somebody like your son or daughter who's in business with you and they can start going out after a whole new market? Well, you know, this was my afternoon yesterday at Chankanov Lagoon. Uh, you, you have to enjoy life and you have to do new things. Financial advisors are energized when they do new things. So if we can help you with the IRFC, be happy to do so. You've got some materials from us in your original handout. Uh, and if you would like, just give me your information or give me a business card, and I'll see to it that you get more information. I'm really convinced that this is an enormous untapped market. And a very small amount of your time, a half a day a week, is all it would take. And pretty soon, you'd be locking in one a quarter, you know, one every other month, and maybe one business a month. That's all you need, and you've doubled, tripled your income.